Hopefully you'll remember from Quantum Mechanics 1.2 that we just got done looking at Max Planck's solution to the ultraviolet catastrophe. After Max Planck had solved the ultraviolet catastrophe, his work on the subject went unspoken about for quite a while. Planck's trick of putting the energy of light into little packets was regarded by himself and most of his colleagues as just that, a trick. But as far back as 1887, evidence was being collected for a phenomenon that would take Planck's trick to new heights and lead to the birth of wave-particle duality. The photoelectric effect was what sparked Einstein to postulate that Planck's light quanta were physical particles. Physicists at the time were really excited about playing around with electricity and doing all sorts of experiments with it. It turned out that if you had a piece of metal and irradiated it with light, you could measure a current flow from it. Electrons were somehow being ejected from the metal surface when exposed to light. We now call these photoelectrons. Now, this effect wasn't impossible at all with the current understanding of both electromagnetic theory and the structure of metals. Physicists at the time had a half-decent model for metallic structure called the Drude model. This was heavily inspired by the statistical mechanics being done at the time. So whilst it was possible under the current theory that electrons could be emitted, many of the observations that followed were simply not possible under the Maxwellian theory of light. The physicists investigating this phenomenon found that, firstly, emission of electrons only occurred when the frequency of the incident light was above a certain threshold frequency that depended on the material. For most metals, it's usually somewhere in the ultraviolet region or above. Secondly, the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted electrons wasn't affected by the intensity of the incident light. The current amplitude would increase, but the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons remained constant for a given frequency. And lastly, the time between light being exposed to the surface and emission of electrons was practically instantaneous. It is, of course, finite, somewhere around 10 to the minus 16, which is incredibly small. None of these experimental observations were accounted for by the classical Maxwellian theory of light. Einstein, however, was able to account for these observations. He postulated that Planck's light quanta were physical particles. Instead of thinking of light as a wave, it could be considered something akin to an electron or a proton. But most importantly, for a given frequency nu, a photon would have a well-defined energy h nu. Einstein proposed a mechanism by which photoelectric emission could occur. When a photon is incident on a metal, it can penetrate into the surface where it has a probability of being absorbed by an electron in the delocalized C. The electron will gain an energy equal to h nu and then undergo transport out of the metal lattice to cause photoelectric emission. The electron, however, will have to do some work to overcome the attraction to the positive ions to keep it bound in the overall structure. So the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons will be the energy imparted on it by the photon, h nu, minus the energy required to leave the metal, something we call the work function phi. The electrons therefore won't be able to leave the metal unless they have enough energy to overcome the work function. The minimum frequency, nu naught, required for the electrons to overcome the work function will be when their maximum kinetic energy is zero. So this frequency, nu naught, is given by phi over Planck's constant. So we see Einstein's model predicts the existence of a threshold frequency, a minimum frequency required to observe photoelectric emission that depends on the material being used, as phi is a property of the metal. Under this mechanism of photoelectric emission, the intensity of the incident radiation wouldn't have any effect on the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, but it would increase the amplitude of the current, since there would be more photons to be absorbed by electrons in the metal. Now, any good theory should produce a plethora of experimentally verifiable results, even if the theory turns out to be wrong. If it produces well-defined predictions that can be tested, by scientific standards, it's a good theory. For a textbook example of a theory that's good but not correct, see the steady state theory in cosmology. To test Einstein's theory, we could imagine having a glass vacuum chamber with a metal cathode at one end and an anode at the other end, connected to an ammeter and a variable voltage source. If we don't apply any potential difference across the electrodes and then irradiate the cathode with some electromagnetic radiation, we can expect to see a current when the frequency of the radiation is above the threshold frequency. Once photoelectric current is flowing, we could increase the potential across the electrodes in a negative polarity, so the electrons have to do work to overcome the potential. Since the potential difference is the work done per unit charge, the work done by the electrons would be E times the potential difference. We could then keep increasing the voltage in the negative sense until no current is observed at some negative potential V0. At this point, the electrons have expended all of their kinetic energy in doing work against the potential. This is what's called a stopping potential. Since at this point, the maximum kinetic energy is equal to EV0, we can relate the stopping potential to the frequency of the incident radiation and the work function. Since E, H and phi are constant, we have a linear relationship between V0 and nu. So if we then change the frequency a bit and readjust the voltage to obtain a new stopping potential, we can gain a series of measurements of V0 and nu. If the theory's predictions are correct, plotting these on a graph should give a linear relationship. 
Of course, if you do this experiment, you'll find exactly that. The theory makes such precise predictions, each of which are experimentally verified, it's hard not to be convinced that light has at least some kind of particle-like nature. The kind of behaviour in which light is considered both a wave and a particle is what's called wave-particle duality, unsurprisingly. The evidence for wave-particle duality doesn't stop at the photoelectric effect. Another significant phenomenon is Compton scattering, named after Arthur Compton. If light really does behave like a particle, then surely it should engage in some other particle-like phenomena. One of the simplest ways two particles can interact with each other is by colliding and bouncing off of each other, a process physicists call scattering. Compton scattering is one such process that needs both wave-particle duality and special relativity to explain it. We could consider a photon with some energy h nu colliding with a stationary electron. In a special relativistic context, the total energy squared of a body of mass m and momentum p is given by the equation e squared equals p squared c squared plus m squared c to the 4. The incoming photon is massless, so it has energy e equals pc equals h nu. The electron, on the other hand, is at rest and has no momentum, so it has energy equal to its mass times c squared. If the photon acts like a particle, then it should scatter off the electron imparting some momentum on it and recoiling at some angle theta. The photon has now lost energy to the electron, so in order to conserve energy, its frequency must change to some new frequency, new prime. If we apply conservation of momentum and energy, we can show that the change in wavelength is h over mec squared times 1 minus cos theta. I'll leave the working out of this to a special relativity series, but it's not too hard to show. This change in wavelength is going to be of the order 10 to the minus 12 meters. In order for this to be comparable to the initial wavelength, Compton scattering is best done with X-rays or gamma rays which have similar or smaller wavelengths. Compton scattering is an effect that's always of consideration when light interacts with matter. And you may be thinking, how can light both scatter off electrons in Compton scattering and be absorbed by them in the photoelectric effect? Well, this is all down to the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. There are lots of different ways in which a photon can interact with an electron. Some are just far more likely than others under certain conditions. But in principle, a number of different interactions will occur when, say, X-rays are fired at a metal surface. In fact, Compton scattering will occur if you do a photoelectric experiment, but it's usually of secondary, if any, importance and won't add too much error to your experiment. But it is happening. Clearly there's a lot of evidence for light acting as a particle, so we'd be justified in asking, is the converse true? Are there particles that act like waves? Yes, all of them. But like almost always, we really only care about electrons. If there were one phenomena we had to pick to test if particles could act like waves, it would surely be diffraction, which makes sense as diffraction is only caused by waves. Diffraction is when a wave, say like light, passes through a slit or around an object, causing it to bend. The most important case is really when light passes through a slit. If we send a beam of light through a very narrow slit and then observe it at some distance away on a screen, we see fringes of light and dark. When the light passes through the slit, it bends and spreads out. The smaller the slit, the more dramatic the bending. When the light reaches the screen, it interferes with itself either constructively or destructively. We won't go into too much detail here, but constructive interference causes the wave amplitude to increase, giving rise to bright fringes, and destructive interference does quite the opposite, suppressing the wave amplitude and giving rise to dark fringes. These light and dark fringes are regularly spaced in well-defined intervals. We call such a pattern an interference pattern. The study of such things is unsurprisingly called interferometry. It's the exact effect that's behind the science of gravitational wave detection, the discovery of the CMBR and X-ray crystallography. Anyway, the point is that these interference patterns are the result of waves diffracting. But experiments can be done to show that electrons do the exact same thing. We can do an experiment a bit like the photoelectric effect, where we have a cathode and an anode inside a vacuum chamber. If we apply a high enough voltage across the electrodes, electrons can be torn from the cathode and accelerated towards the anode. But if the anode is made out of a mesh rather than a solid sheet of material, most of the electrons will pass straight through, effectively creating an electron gun. This itself has a bunch of applications, but if we fire the electrons at a thin sheet of metal with a photodetector on the other side, we actually observe circular diffraction patterns, as the electrons diffract through the metal in a wave-like nature. So electrons must also have some kind of wave-like nature as well. The wave-particle duality of matter is what led Louis de Broglie? De Broglie? De Broglie? De, de Broglie? To postulate that matter particles had some wavelength lambda inversely proportional to their momentum by Planck's constant h or equivalently p equals h bar k. So with the wave-particle duality of all things firmly in place, physicists were able to answer a really important question. Why haven't all of the atoms exploded? 